So today, um, I, I guess I'll start with the warning. There's a lot of me this morning. So uh, if you've suddenly remembered a meeting you'd forgotten, that's OK. I won't judge you. Uh, but let's, let's take it back. We are, as I say, day four. Let's go back to Monday. Um, where do we start on Monday? Well, we started Rebe with Rebecca. And we started with Rebecca telling you what we, she likes to call the origin story of outreach. And, and really, the origin story of outreach is, is what it's all about for us. Because not only does it embody our sort of mission values in terms of conservation, doing good, it, it tells uh, how Rebecca went about you know, getting her neighbors together and using geotools as a way to uh, fight against the logging program. And this is what makes our team so special, is that the people on it, the people that you've met this week, we all kind of have these origin stories like that. For example, Sean, when uh, Google Earth came out, he was doing his master's thesis. And he wrote this incredible master's thesis. He'll say otherwise, but trust me, it's a great piece of work. Uh, about using a biological reserve sensor network and building this like with 3D models and network links, this way of accessing that data in Google Earth. I, this was part of my inspiration in working with Google Earth long before I even knew Sean. Uh, he also told me the other day about how he wrote this big long list of uh, features and uh, things he wanted to see changed in Google Earth before he worked for Google. And it was one of the things that helped get him noticed here. Uh, and now, of course, it's his job to make those changes in Google Earth. Um, and others have stories like that. Karen used to run a GIS lab. And now she runs the AirView program, which is out there collecting tons and tons of uh, air quality GIS data. She's basically doing for air quality what John Snow once did for mapping cholera in Victorian London. Um, Brian took his love of diving and looking at sea creatures to actually do something about having no sea creatures still to look at with the Global Fishing Watch pro program. Uh, Christian was in the Peace Corps. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he did things related to urban environmental management. Now he can control, or working in the Skybox for Good program, he can literally target satellites. He's got his own satellites, or at least Google has their own satellites. And he's able to like, collect daily images in urban or other areas. So he has this uh, ability to have an impact in an area that he cares about. And I could go on and on through the team, because this is a common theme. Um, in my own case, I, uh, I was just uh, starting a postdoc when Google Earth came out uh, at the Alaska Volcano Observatory. I'm a, a volcanologist by training. And we thought Google Earth is an amazing tool. We, we, we thought, oh, the potential for education and scientific visualization. So we started doing things with it. And we, we through a friend, set up a meeting at Google. And so we came down. This is almost 10 years ago. And the, the meeting was supposed to be with one sort of the higher ups on the Earth team. And he passed it off to a engineer, a new lower engineer who had started there about six months before. Uh, little did I know at the time, that meeting was going to shape the course of my life, because that new engineer that passed it off to was a person by the name of Rebecca Moore. And eight years later, she helped recruit me into my role on the team. So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, when it comes to Google's GeoTools, when it comes to our program Geo for Good, it's ultimately about telling a story, about crafting a narrative. You've learned over the last few days how to make maps, how to work with Google's base map, how to add, collect, manipulate imagery, um, analyze it, and say Earth Engine. But in order to bring it all together, in order to reach the public, reach the government officials, elders, teachers, students, politicians, who whatever it is that you're trying to make an impact on, you've got to create that narrative. So that's why today for me is, is kind of in some ways, the most exciting today, because we're going to run through and, and run sessions on the tools that you can use to create those stories, to craft those narratives. And of course, the obvious place to start with this is Google Earth. So we've had a number of Google Earth sessions already, but today is going to uh, focus on storytelling with Google Earth. Now, I did have a demo all nicely lined up to show a Google Earth tour, as we call them, 
Um, but I decided to change what I was going to show you approximately like five minutes ago. Because I uh, realized Sean has launched the new Voyager layer. So I haven't even looked at this. So if it doesn't work, Sean's at the back. Um, no. Uh, so with Voyager, I think he's, he uh, mentioned this earlier in the week. He's, uh, we're using the base imagery, satellite imagery, Street View, other imagery to uh, find amazing animal footage in Earth. So apparently what he set up is some little cards that appear that fly you to locations. Hippos, this is one of the great ones. This is, I believe, uh, oh no, first hill, sorry. They just look like hippos from that far up. So, um, so many of these African ones are some of the original sort of uh, layers in Google Earth. The Michael Fay flyover project where he flew his Cessna all around Africa and captured amazing footage, particularly of animals. So you guys can explain, uh, explore that yourself. But the point I was going to make here is Google has this built-in storytelling or, or tour creating tool. Now, there's a number of ways to do this, all the way from what we call an automated tour, or I call an automated tour, where you can just make a folder of points. And maybe I should show that first, because that would make more sense. So for example, here. I have a number of place marks in Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and I put them in a folder, and I'm able to just highlight that folder, hit play, and it moves around those points, and in this case, pops the balloon, um, which I also have the same photo in. Now, you'll see the little play slider that's down the bottom there. That's, that's the tour control. You can create your own uh, sort of self-generated tours, just by going up the top here, this video cam button, sorry, the hand's in the way, brings up uh, two buttons, a red button and a blue button. So if you choose the red pill, it will just record uh, movement. If you go for the blue pill, it gets sound as well. Um, I'm not going into this in detail because that's what the session's for, but just real quickly, just to demonstrate this, I'm going to randomly move around, hit stop, and it repeats that motion. But then the really nice thing about this is what you created is scripted KML. So you're able to uh, go here. Now, if you're over 30, this is the floppy disk button. Um, <laughs> if you're younger than 30, it's the white box with the blue box in the middle. So um, either way, it saves it out as a KML file. So if you want to learn more about that, the, uh, the master of tours is at the back there, Sean. And I believe he is running the session today. Now. As I mentioned, Sean is the expert on tours, and he's used them for many years, and he's done amazing things with them. But even he has got frustrated over the years of some of like, the finicky things related to them. So to solve this problem, he, along with others such as Jordan, built an entirely new product called Tour Builder. Now, the idea behind Tour Builder was trying to simplify that Google Earth tour experience. Now, unfortunately, with the Earth API going away, this is now a maps touring experience for now. Um, but, and if we go into Tour Builder, but what it gives us uh, is an experience where we have a map and we have kind of a PowerPoint sort of slides on part of the screen. To show this real quickly, uh, here we are. Now, I like to do this on the theme of bunnies. Please don't judge, I, I am in therapy. Um, but uh, just to show one of these, let's see, I think this is a good one. Let's go to one point. So you can kind of see the screen here. If we, if we go into play full screen mode, what we have is the map, points, lines. And then on the other side, we have kind of this information card, images, text. Uh, so if we go to one of these points, we can actually step through is the best way that you follow the narrative. So if we go here, we can add images in, or we can add uh, YouTube videos in. For example, this thing. Now. This is an island uh, off the coast of uh, Japan, Okinoshima, that um, it was a what chemical weapons factory in World War II. And they decided they needed to re rehabilitate the image. So after the war, they turned it into a bunny sanctuary. Now, personally, I find this even more scary than the chemical weapons. But <laughs> that's just me. Anyway, you can learn all about Tour Builder from Jordan. All right, next up. Time lapse, and maybe I won't go full screen. Let's skip 
st skip straight to the program. Uh, you've, I think most of you are familiar with this already. We took 29 years of Landsat imagery, aggregated it all together, and created this temporal and spatial uh, uh, sort of animated movie of the planet, where you can see amazing things such as the growth of Las Vegas over time. Uh, we released this uh, with a great article in Time magazine. What was great about the article is it wasn't just, oh, here's a bunch of examples. They crafted a narrative around that, both the history of Landsat and the narrative of that area they're looking at, be it climate change and uh, glacier retreat in Alaska or the changes going on in desert areas. Um, one of my personal favorites is right here. This is a river in Peru, I think. And you can see on this time scale, river changes. It's, it's really incredible. You know, when I was uh, when I was a professor, I used to teach geography classes and I taught physical geography. And this was just an amazing tool to hammer home the message of, of how the landscape changes. The final area I want to mention is Street View. Now, it may not seem off the bat that Street View is an obvious storytelling tool, but this is, this is the area that I've been putting a lot of work into, and I hope to convince you otherwise that this is, in fact, a very strong storytelling tool. Uh, I'm going to show it by this example. Here we are, average student in Japan, right? Well, this image was captured in 2008. If I go up the top here, we have something called Time Machine that allows me to jump to a different time, 2013. That was the same street. What the heck happened? Well. If I bounce back to 2011, I think we start to understand because we can see the foundations of the buildings that were left. This is one of the towns that was impacted by the 2011 tsunami. And what's really powerful, this, this story to me, is uh, one of the things they found in the foundations in Japan were these stone tablets with ancient Japanese on. And when they translated it, it said, don't build here, this is where the tsunamis come to. And that got kind of forgotten and literally built over. But with tools like Street View, we can start to kind of hopefully at least remember the story and the message. Um, and an area we're really trying to work on with this has been with our special collects and other you know, really fun Street View footage. So the idea that it's not just the case of we do these collects, but the idea that we can tell stories about them. Rebecca showed this page real briefly. And this is the program that I'm working on, the idea that we can take the Street View imagery we can take tools like Cardboard, this virtual reality viewer where we can go into a street view image on our phone, put it in here, and have what we call an immersive experience. And that is an incredibly powerful tool to really bring this storytelling home. 